So we're going to open up the floor for discussion. I've got a bunch of questions, but I'd much rather that you ask them. So if you'd like to, please think about from that discussion from Darby. But maybe, maybe I should give the floor to Mondly for a minute and, uh, and just ask you to comment on what you've heard. Maybe start there, and then we'll take some questions from the floor. Okay. Firstly, I think, you know, that I want to change my title to that guy from Kirstenbosch. I want to be the head of the Orthonautica Society. There's <laughs> 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 two things, and I think I, I'm glad you ended on that note, because I think we're going to go straight from here to drinks, I think, um, after that. Look, I think I, I agree totally with the flags. Um, and the one, I think, where we can possibly go wrong, and I think it's, it's, it's very important, and, and that is the Venezuela option. Because there's a, what's happened, what happened over the past 10 years of Jacob Zuma was massive destruction. Um, everything was destroyed, not only the economy, but the institutions. And towards the end of the Zuma era, um, the rise of populism, uh, the more the Zuma regime got more desperate, then you had the rise of populism. And which has brought us to where we are today with the land debate. And basically the, the search for easy answers, easy solutions. Um, I think land being one, but the more important thing, the more important subtext, and it's not even a subtext, it's a, much bigger than that, is what we are going to do with the Constitution in order to achieve that. And the stripping away of the Constitution and cheapening the Constitution in order to achieve those cheap results. And this will, I mean, like, if this succeeds, then that will make us, make it so much easier to strip away constitutional provisions in future. And I think that, that's, a, that's a huge flag that we need to look at right now and make sure that that, that principle, that, that a change to a constitution is a very, 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 very last resort. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the one thing. And then the other, and I want to disagree, Davi, and, and claim about the job summit um, and I'm, I'm the journalist here, I'm supposed to be the cynical guy, and I swallowed that Kool-Aid. And not because I believe that the Job Summit is going to create jobs. I just think it's important to focus minds, it was an important thing, to focus minds on the fact that, on reversing unemployment and creating employment. Um, having those the major three parties in society, labor, government, and business, in one room, talking about strategies of creating jobs. Of course, it's about economic growth, but the country has to, if there's one single thing that the country needs to be focused on, it's employment. Hmm. And how you go about it is it's one thing. And then the second one is, I think, the investment summit that's, that's, that's coming up. We shouldn't be having an investment summit, but it's important that we have an investment summit because the country needs to start talking again about how to get going. Mm -hmm. And I think what that will build up to probably is a social accord. But I think those are conversations that we need to have. If we were talking about this a year ago, kind of like during the Zuma years, I would have been a lot more cynical and unbelieving, but I think there is a will to govern now. And, if, and I think the key thing for us as a society is then to hold these people, to hold government, to hold business, to hold labor, to, to account every three months or so, mm -hmm. what has happened, what has happened to those agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Lovely. Just, thanks. Super, Monli. Thanks very much for that. I've got lots of questions, but I'm sure you've got more. So please just raise your hand and make your, say your name and make your question sharp and short. So I'm gonna take three and then Sue would like to pick them up in the panel. There's one, two, one more, three. Lovely. Shall I go? Yep. So it's uh, Mark. So it's a, a question and a sort of a, a view, a comment. Um, I like what, the, what, what Clement has said around entrepreneurship and how that links, I mean, how that sort of goes to, to jobs. 
But one of the challenges that we, we face in this country for entrepreneurship is access to capital. Um, you know, if you want to borrow a million bucks from the bank, you have to have a million rands worth of assets. And with our history of South Africa, not everybody's in that sort of fortunate position. So access to capital is one. And then I think the second part is, you know, when you're dealing with, so everybody wants to deal with corporates and, and sort of establish businesses in, in terms of providing service or products to them. The sort of payment terms are, are quite challenging. You know, you're looking at a 60 or a 90 day sort of from, from invoice or statement. And then to sustain, a, to deliver the service and the product and then carry yourself for 90 days or 60 days is, is challenging as an entrepreneur. And I just want to keen to get the thoughts and views of how do we move to change that? Because mm -hmm. that seems to be institutional. So it's access to capital, access to credit. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm Andrew. I just have a question. Um, obviously, we're going to scenario planning. It's, it's, it's obviously quite complex, a lot of variables at play. And you've, you've raised six very, very important flags for scenario <coughs> as an economy. But I'd like to know where in scenario planning do we start looking at best practices and benchmarks from other economies? Because we seem to be making the same mistakes as many other cap countries throughout the world. And it just surprises me that as, uh, as the, the humanity that learned from our mistakes, mm -hmm. that as economies we can't do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely question. And the lady at the back. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, so I wanted to just uh, reflect on global warming um, and the fact that um, with America and China not necessarily co-signing on the emissions goals, um, it's evident to me that the green economy and everything that drives it, i.e. the minerals that various countries have, um, are going to be very important. And I feel South Africa has the wrong collection of minerals. So how does that look in a country or in a world that is very quickly needing to change and with your big powerhouses not necessarily driving that change, but that change having to come? Lovely. Thank you. Thanks very much. So three interesting questions. I don't know who, Darby, would you tackle maybe the first one about credit and capital and anyone sure. else wants to add, maybe they can. Okay. Well, um, I'll be quick on that. Yes, uh, South Africa's, well, South Africa's interest rates are actually not high, if you're talking about the cost of capital. But I think your question is more broadly than simply the cost of capital um, um, from an interest, point, uh, interest rates point of view or the access to, uh, to capital. I can tell you, um, we, money is the easiest thing to get. If you've got a proper business plan, there are many institutions in South Africa that, that specialize in providing money uh, to people. But the, the, easy, the most difficult part is to actually write the proper business plan. And I get it so many times, people call to me and say, listen, they want money for A, B, and C. And I tell them, where's your paper? Where's a piece of paper? And they haven't got that. And I can promise you, if you've got a good plan, you will get the money. That's not, without a doubt. Hmm. And the short-term credit problem of government playing too slowly? No, that is just get government out of that. That's not government's business. But many yeah. people depend on government yeah. to pay them. And it's well, often many, an access point to start No, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, next because, okay. because, you know, uh, there's, the, the, our biggest shareholder in my company is the, uh, is the tax man. Mm. I mean, I, I borrow, we borrow money to buy other businesses or to start businesses because we don't have money because tax man takes all of that. And they misuse that in many instances. Mm. So we leave that money in my hands and I promise you I will invest it in the mm. economy. But there are, there are people, I mean, there are uh, 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 private equity companies mm. that specialize in looking for opportunities. Mm. So they, without a doubt, there's a lot of money Lovely. available. Super. Yeah. Clem, did you want to comment on that? No, I mean, I mean, it's an absolutely important question because uh, it would be one of the subjects that I would discuss at, at an enterprise summit. And by the way, I, I, w I was very pro uh, the job summit. It's just that I would li like mm. to have had more about enterprise mm. Different focus. Uh, than thing. But, but the idea of bringing uh, the main players together to start implementing mm. is, is fantastic. So please, I, I'm, I'm as happy about the fact mm. that we've had a job summit and going to have the investment summit. I just want to concentrate on this whole flag of the changing nature of work. Um, in, in America, for example, you go to virtually any state uh, in the center of America, Americans have two or three jobs um, because that's how they treat work. Um, and that's why they have such a low unemployment rate is that they have this natural entrepreneurial talent and, and we've got to look at a way of doing that. But absolutely that banks 
are going to have to think of a way of making it easier to access capital for small business, just like the Grameen Bank did in Bangladesh. Mm. We're going to need something along those lines in South Africa. But would we agree, just let me open this up a bit to, to Mondi's point about the value of summits, that, as, that, that Cyril's approach, the President's approach, is to try and create consensus and bring people together in this pre-election period. Is that part of your... Yeah, no, definitely. Re rebuilding consensus about where we are. Yeah, and that is what he was skilled at, right. and that's why, basically, he, he, he was so good in, in the early 90s. Right. Um, unfortunately, right now, as was pointed out earlier on, is that he is weak because he does not have the full support of his party. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, that is a classic bureaucrat's approach of trying to create consensus. And the second point is focusing more on the economy and investment will naturally uh, have an impact. That's the theory. Yeah, definitely. And I think just, I just want to add that I think also his approach, which is actually great because I mean, like it does in a way take us back mm -hmm. and we will never get back to the Mandela years, mm -hmm. but in a way, in a Mandela light, 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 light way, um, is that he is concentrating more on building power outside of the ANC, mm -hmm. getting society mm -hmm. to be working together. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very key. key. Mm -hmm. Um, if we saw, for instance, yesterday, um, his decision about the appointment of the new head of the NPA, that he's got the power to just simply appoint someone, mm. but he actually, he's actually did decided to consult every legal group in South mm. Africa and get them to nominate and get them mm. to, to find I found candidates. And that's the, very important. The committee he established on land was very interesting. He sort of threw everyone in the room and said, come out with an answer. And you wrote a column uh, just the other day about the land summit you went to and how positive an experience that was. Do you want to just say it again? Yeah. Um, so last week, um, we, had, we hosted a land summit, um, Rapport and City Press, together. And we brought together everybody from people economic, economically, economists, and we brought climatology and so there's the whole day we looked at every aspect and then the last day the last session was the political parties which in a way you could say was probably the least important because so much more practical stuff had been discussed during the day but the level of people finding each other people still disagreed very strongly and they mm. fought strongly but over tea and over lunch and over certain liquids afterwards people really found each other and you could see people exchanging numbers and mm. and the EFF and Afri and no, not, not, not Afri Forum, the Frey, Frey, FF Plus, okay, I wanted to, to use the, the proper name for it, and AgriSA, kind of like they were, you actually found that they could find points where they, where they could meet. And I think it's a, it's a thing that we need to redevelop, especially after the polarization of the right. past few years. And if I could just say one yeah, more thing on that, ne? yeah, I'm um, just something that was uh, as part of the flag thing, um, which actually gave some hope, was a thing that in the political party session, Zbandu Holomisa said we should stop panicking about land, about the land thing, the, the mm -hmm. because the ANC and the EFF, who are the sponsors of the motion, will never find each other. Mm -hmm. EFF is demanding nationalization, the ANC has got all sorts of caveats, so it's not going to happen. Um, and he says, just, let's all just relax. Let them get on with it. And that was before the whiskey or? <laughs> just before the just whiskey. Just before the whiskey. <laughs> all right. Clem, do you want to talk about the minerals portfolio and that lovely, interesting question? Well, no. The, the, the question on the, on the scenario, you know, what about the, the formula for a winning nation? Mm. We, we oh, actually, sorry, in, yes. the, in the original scenario, mm. actually, uh, the high road, low road, we put together a portrait of a winning nation, which was quality of education, work ethic, small government, low taxation. You know, we, we actually did do that. Uh, it's just that I couldn't possibly go into oh. all the other stuff. But it, you're quite right. You, you have to construct sort of what are the rules to win. Hmm. Once you've got the flags and the scenarios, you've got to, to look at that. That's the positive way of saying it. The question was really about <coughs> why don't we learn from our and other people's mistakes? And why don't we benchmark more? And I d let me just offer this. I think South Africa is an island. It's uh, surrounded two thirds by sea anyway. <laughs> and it's surrounded by very small, weak, largely strategically irrelevant states. So it lives in its own bubble. 
And so why don't we benchmark more? And where's the best practice? And if you haven't been to Silicon Valley or to these, these zones of innovation, we're actually going off the pace. And so it, it is that question. Any, any comments on why we don't learn faster and why we don't learn from our mistakes? Well, well I, I'd just like to add one extra thing, which is we've had it too good. You know, we've, you know, unfortunately, uh, during the last 10 years, we've, we've actually slid from a, a state where we were, we were on, particularly on this continent, a fairly opulent nation, you know, not, not, not in terms of equality, because I'm the first to say that we've had a highly unequal society, but now our backs are to the wall, because unfortunately all the money has gone in corruption. So that's when you have to start learning what the global rules of the game are. And so we now know that there are certain things we have to do to dig ourselves out of the hole. Hasn't the money gone more offshore? Well, I think a lot of it has gone offshore. So it's not that it's not going to be recovered. Not the corruption money, but the <coughs> companies have left. Yeah, but that's why we've got to yeah, go back to discussing how we can recreate the kind of, uh, right. you know, the, the, the business-oriented society that we had 40 or 50 years ago where we had some of the top companies, uh, com in, the companies in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can, uh, um, your first, you, you had a, corruption was your first flag, if I, can, I remember correctly. correctly. But um, I think there's a much more important flag. And that, that comes down to your question about why don't we learn. And that is simply because of astonishing levels of incompetence in the state. I mean, they are so useless, you can't believe it. And they are useless because of a number of reasons. I mean, just go to any of these in, in, in eptocratic institutions out there and see the, 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 the way they treat you, for, just to, for starters. So the levels of incompetence, of, it's really and it's hugely negative for the economy. That, I think, is more important. And a very good example is what's going on in education in South Africa. Now, that brings me to, in, in a way, that links to your land thing. The land thing, it's not actually about land, by the way. It is about private property. It's an ideological thing. And the moment the state starts stealing private property from individuals, that moment the state loses legitimacy. So it's, it's not about land. It's about private property. And even if it is about land, land is not important. Land is just part of the mix. The really important stuff, the stuff that's going to grow economies, is what you do with the stuff. And that is to do with, with, with the technological. If you want to get involved in agri agriculture, go study genetic engineering. That's agriculture today. Or become a, a financial guru, whatever. That's agriculture today. Nothing to do with the land. The real value add is not happening on the land. It happens in a, in a, in a lab and it happens at the university. And they don't even see that. They think it's about land. It's not about land. Morning. Yeah, just very quickly. Um, I think the answer is that we, we lost 10 years. I think the past decade was a wasteland. Um, Jacob Zuma was not interested in governing. He was not interested in building a premier league nation. He was not interested in keeping South Africa up there. He was not interested in anything. He was basically interested in feeding himself, his family, and his extended crony world. So, just that's why we don't learn, because we, did, we, we could not learn anything, because we, we, stu we did not only stand still, but we went backwards. But I think, you know, we, we've learned our lessons, and we learned our lessons early on in our life as a country. And I think the key thing now, now that we've had the turnaround, I mean, like, and we're not yet out of the woods, but now that we've had the turnaround, and I think it's a key thing that we, I know I'm going to sound like that movie, Dead Poet Society, and yeah. I mean, like, it's a... It, there is a point now that we actually, once we are through this, once we are done with this very useless and debilitating debate that we are currently having about land, and that we actually start to reset as a country and move forward. And I think that's the, and and we, and Dave is actually absolutely correct. I think let's leave government. Let, let's uh, for a time and not rely so much on the state doing anything because the state mm -hmm. is highly incapable. One of the key, one of the most important chapters of the National Development Plan is one that talks about the capable state. Mm -hmm. And you, if that could be fixed, we could actually start to go somewhere, but that's not going to happen over overnight. And when you were editor of the Sunday Crimes, um, you, you, wrote, <laughs> you wrote headline after headline. I'm just thinking where we are at the harbour. Headline after headline attacking. Were you surprised that we were a 
in, as in a constitutional format, able to change the leadership of the ANC? Were you surprised that we achieved what we did in the last two years? A lot of it was led by the media, the courts, even the middle class got off at Zimmer frames and marched. Uh, are you, are you, are you, you know, you talked about constitutional. Zoom yeah. is making speeches now about yeah. the supremacy of parliament versus the constitution. I don't know if you saw his speech in Lombard. Yeah. So are, are you, were you surprised we were matured to the point of changing the leadership? You know, one of the pluses and minuses and pluses of us as a country is that we are so disobedient. I mean, like we, we don't like authority. Um, and it, it hurts us because then kind of like the N2 gets blocked all the time and so on, and people don't pay for their electricity. But South Africans are very rebellious, and I think that's one thing that has saved us from being one of, going the route of some post-liberation countries, like the country next door, for instance. I mean, we protest at the, at the earliest thing. So even during Thabo Mbeki's time, when it was much better than now, but I mean, when we Mbeki was criticized a lot for being kind of like very much authoritarian and, and he, had, he had his mistakes. But this society managed to force Mbeki to back down on his AIDS denialism. Um, and, and at that time, the ANC was at 66%, but the, the society forced Mbeki to, 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 to do so. Um, but, and then, then ANC gave us Jacob Zuma. And, but we could have gone down that route. Mm -hmm. um, the Zuma regime could have continued in another guise um, post-December. But what you saw in 2016, 2017, um, the protests on the streets, even Kosatu mm -hmm. turning against him. I mean, basically it's a society saying, no, Enough. we will that's, that's far no further. Thank you. Yeah. Clem, just to, do you want to comment on the minerals? No, I, I want to just comment on the third question, which was okay. about uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the global warming. Mm. It's, it's a really tough issue because for most countries um, without wealth, they want to spread electricity as cheaply as possible. I remember doing a session in Delhi with European, uh, Euro Euro European experts on climate change and Indian utility chiefs. And I always remember the utili Indian utility chief saying to the Europeans, you guys created the problem. Now you want mm. us to pay for it mm. by thinking of alternative means of energy, such as nuclear and, uh, and not going for coal, which is clearly the cheapest way of getting power to the people in India. And it is, it's a really tough question, this. I would distinguish between America and China, because America has left the Paris Accord, whereas China hasn't, and China is putting a lot of emphasis on solar power. But it is, it's, it, this is a really tough issue for, 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 for mankind, because it's come out of the sort of left field that climate change is going to really affect us this century. A lot of people thought it was two or three hundred years away. And when people say, ah, oh, it's a load of rubbish, I say, when you want to know about the heart, you, you consult a cardiologist. <laughs> um, and I'm not about to say that, that the climate change scientists are talking rubbish. I know there are people who make money out of doing that. I just, you know, um, think that they've, they've studied the far, far better than we have. And this latest report is, is really serious, that we, we're going to face real problems. And we haven't even started having the conversation which... which, which you, you rarely refer to is what kind of economy mm. is a real green economy and what kind of minerals will, will one use and, and what should one steer away from? We all know that fossil fuels, which includes coal and oil, are not good news. And look, there are some positive developments with electric cars, but then if electric cars are fueled by electricity, which comes from coal-burning power stations, that's, you've, you've got to consider the whole chain. Mm. Uh, so... It's a, it's a very open question at the moment, but there's no doubt the flags are going up everywhere that we are, we are in much more extreme weather. And when people say, no, nah, it was just like this two, 200 years ago, and it's just that there are more people in the world, I, I just say, well, I, I, I've, I've got to go with the, the people who are the experts mm. on this. What, what is okay. your take on the future of mining in the country, Clem? <clears throat> well, the, the one thing about mining in this country is this, that... The old geologists were very good. 
they've discovered things. I mean, I was lucky to be in the mining industry when they were dis still discovering uh, major deposits of gold, uh, major deposits, um, and I mean, the Venetia diamond mine, major diamond deposits. We all sort of focus on the mining charter and getting the, the real thing is, where are the next prospects? Which, 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 which parts of South Africa are very promising? How are we going to get um, companies, either junior exploration companies or the, or the big guys, to, to actually go out and find new stuff? Because for me, having been in the mining industry here for s such a long time, the biggest difference is that we're just not finding the new stuff the way we used to, and it's the same around the world. The old geologists found the stuff that was easy to find, easy to mine, and all that kind of thing. We've now got to come up with a much better uh, strategy to find the stuff that is hard to find, but which could lead to the resurrection of the mining industry in this country. Lovely. Right, I'm going to take three more questions. Uh, one, two, and that's on the left there. Yes. Get the mic. Oh, all right, we're starting at the back end, that's fine. There we go, lady in the, in the green. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, uh, my name's Andrea. Um, for me, the most critical flag, I think, is, is the education system one, um, purely because um, I'm a working mom, so I see what my kids are learning at school, I see how they're learning, I see the way they're measured, and um, simultaneously I see, I'm out of the job market, I can see jobs are changing every single day, um, they're morphing into, into different um, formats, they're being done away with, um, and our education system is just not changing with that. So. How do you see this change happening? Us as lay people, how, how do you um, encourage us to change that? Is it, I mean, do we begin with the, the small um, education systems or the larger ones or even homeschooling? And um, what's the best way about go, to go about doing that? Lovely, thank you. And then in the front here, if we get the mic to the front, the two gentlemen in the blue shirt. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I think maybe a comment first and then I'll follow up with a question. Um, you know, my observation is in the last couple of years, what's actually happened is with all this negativity and, you know, stories around corruption and, you know, everything we've been exposed to, what it's actually done is it's mobilized society um, to agree more on what we don't want. You know, in the same way that we all rejected apartheid, I think in a funny way, in the last couple of years, we've seen more civil society involvement in, in having a voice and, you know, people standing up for what they don't want and, and what the country needs to be going forward. But I think also, you know, what worries me is the fact that when I look at the audit companies, I don't know how we, we trust them. You know, if we look at what's come out, I mean, do we trust CAs anymore, right? And, and what does that look like going forward? Because I think we don't talk much about that. You know, um, for me, <laughs> and I'll use KPMG as an example, but we don't know what more is going to come out moving forward. And a lot of the, the stories that are coming up are about big organizations. We're not talking about small companies, you know, we're talking the standoffs of the world. What more is going to be uncovered as we move forward? And I'm not hearing much about that. I mean, it kind of, we hear much about it only when it's reported on and then kind of disappears. And you almost get a sense that corruption is always linked with government, but never with the private sector. You know, a few years ago, there was a whole lot of, you know, stories around collusion that happens. And we know collusion still continues to happen. We don't hear much about that. Um, so for me, the question really is, the state of affairs around the, the uh, audit companies, you know, how does that make us feel? Because 
I still think there's so much more that's going to come out. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks. Pass it to the gent on your right. There you are. So I think access to information does not mean that you have access to the right information. I think we live in an age where information is so easily accessible. And often what we read is not necessarily from people who are experts or people from a position of knowledge. If you look at who the key follow, who people follow in our generation, it's a lot of celebrities and personalities in sport. And these people are generally not business people, but they always have a viewpoint on how things should be done. And I think that skews how a lot of the younger guys coming to business view the world. So I think that's just my viewpoint, but I think my question is to Davi. I think I like your frankness. So a question I have for you is, as a taxpayer in this country, understanding where there's brain drain, people are leaving, do you have any forecast in terms of where we're going in the next two, three years? What are the pressures we can expect as taxpayers in the country? What, what, what? What, what are the pressures that we can what expect pressure? coming Lovely. in the next two to three years? Super. Three great questions. So education, anybody wanted to pick that up? I know Clem, you made some comments. Darby, let's start. Edu education is a very easy one. The answer is I don't know, and that's the right answer. Because things are going to change so much, the best that you can do for education is just to try to keep up to date with things, what's happening, and just keep your eyes open. Make sure you're well informed. That's the best way of it. Should of, parents of, play a more positive role than they have? They should be playing a more positive role, not only in the, in the lives of your kids, but yeah. in your own education, right. continuous education. Ah, in your own education yeah. as a parent to lead your kids, as, as uh, helping make sure your kids are getting the right sure. curriculum. And of course, you would not say, and pressuring the institution to reform. No, no, I th by the way, I think universities, think no that business plan is completely outdated. Lovely. The thing is going to okay. change. Um, I, I'd like to say two things in answer to your question. The first is, from my experience as 12 years as head of the Anglo Chairman's Fund, the principal variable of a school is the principal. <laughs> and if you actually have good principals, they can turn bad schools into extremely good schools and good schools into exceptional schools. So I, I feel there should be a principal's academy. And I obviously do believe that the school council should have the ability to appoint and dismiss yeah. uh, principals so that there is accountability mm. uh, of principals. And the second point is that one of the terrible things about flags is if it doesn't suit you, the flag can be right there in front of your eyes, but it's an inconvenient truth. It's, it's just like that green flag that uh, we, we, mm. we've just talked about. And it is an inconvenient truth that schools, not just here in South Africa, but in the UK and elsewhere, are teaching kids for the, for the job market that existed 50 years ago mm -hmm. and not the job market of today. Mm. But it just requires such a reconstruction of the product that people simply don't want to, mm -hmm. to see the flag. And so we've made a start, as I said, with this Growing Foxes mm -hmm. program, which has really become popular in, in private schools in South Africa to try and teach kids uh, how to think in a more entrepreneurial way. But it should be something that is really taken up. Mm. Yeah. Good. Marley, do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um, I think, firstly, we've got to get basic education right. And, of course, you need, a, you need kids to be literate and numerate. And that you're not getting right. And the reasons are, for that are multiple, and, and yeah, it's a, there's a dysfunctional education system, and there's a, an all too powerful trade union in the sector that's destroying, basically kind of like, that's the greatest enemy of the South African child. So there's that problem that we're not fixing. I mean, even before you get to teaching kids how to live in this world and in the world that's coming. I've got a, I'm busy waging a war with my 16 year old who's in grade 11. Um, who thinks he knows what he wants. He wants to be a music mogul, and he, and he knows the stuff. I mean, like, he's got his, the technology and so on, and he's, he's got it all worked out. And because he knows what he wants, he wants to, doesn't feel he needs metric. And, and basically, this next year for him is going to be a useless year. Um, but like he is going to pass, it's not as if he's doing badly, but like he's, he, be, he believes that, that this, we are, we're holding him back. And, but, I, <clears throat> but the thing is, unfortunately, that work is not being done within the schooling system, it's being done by people outside, I mean, like, like this particular project. For and there's a lot of that going on. I mean, and 
people teaching kids coding and so on and so on. There are, there are great initiatives that are there. So I, I don't think we should be totally bleak about it. It's just the fact that most South African kids mm. are going to be left behind. Right, let's turn to the question of trust and measurement governance and KPMG and accountants. <laughs> Hand the mic over, Monli. Can, can, can I answer that? Can, can I answer that? Ahead. Okay, now I'll, 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 I'll come after you. Yeah. Okay, the answer to that is very easy. It's like I'm, I'm in business, we buy and sell businesses every day, we do negotiations every day, and I can promise you, if you want to destroy your corporate life, start, become a crook. Because business is about one thing, and one thing only, only and that's relationships. So, of course, there are a lot of crooks out there, without a doubt. And I promise you, you create, you, you say, everybody knows everybody in the industry. And I can promise you, business is not out there to undermine other business. If I may answer the, the tax question. Sure. Um, of course, there are a couple of bad apples. Here's the situation. Here's the reality. We, uh, government can't just reset something. Government's got to do something actively. The state finances is in really, really deep trouble. We've got to fix that. Now, there are only two ways of fixing that. Well, the third way is economic growth. Two ways of fixing. Spend less, and that means you, may not, you have to make a lot of people very angry. The politicians simply don't have the, the guts to do that. The second one is increase taxes. They can't really increase borrowing. They're going to do that, but then you're going to run into all sort of other troubles. So increase taxes. That's what's going to happen. And in fact, they're considering a lot of tax increases. We've had a lot of tax increases. Well, that's what's going to happen. State finance, very easy at the moment, is totally unsustainable. The only way they can, can stabilize this is to cut state spending by about 6 or 7% annually, and the longer you postpone that, the more you need to cut it to, stay, to, to stabilize state spending. Mm. We are in serious trouble. Mm. And the taxpayers simply cannot afford this bloated, totally incompetent, useless state anymore. That's right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked for Frank, you got yeah. Darby. <laughs> go ahead, Monday. Yeah. Um, you know, wherever you go in the world, the state the state stroke government will always be held to greater account and will be scrutinized a lot more than the private sector. That's because they are accountable to us. They report, we elect them, and they govern, we pay them taxes to do things. So if there's corruption in the public sector, it's likely to get a lot more attention than corruption in the, in the private sector, even though there's, there are two people I mean, like, there, there, there are two parties to corruption. So, and it's not a South, it's so it's not a South African phenomenon. It's there throughout the world. Um, but having said that, there should be a greater focus on private what the wrongdoings that happen in the in, in the private sector. And actually, a lot has changed in in, re, in the recent part in the recent past. <laughs> I mean, the, the codes that have come through, in, in, in our case, it's the, the King Code, it's been updated so many times, and where the corporate sector are not just treated, are, are treated, uh, they're, they're, sorry, yeah, they're held to very high standards and they're scrutinized and the shareholder has been, has been the, the shareholder stroke investor and the investment community has been more greatly empowered to hold corporates mm -hmm. to account. Um, and so that, that is happening. And you asked about collusion. Um, you, know, we, you know about collusion, you know about it because it was widely reported. It's not like it was hidden. And whether it was in the food, in the, in, in the, in the retail sector, in the construction sector and so on. And the competition authorities have done, an, did their job, particularly in the, with regard to the, the construction sector. They did, a, they, they did their job. The people who have not done their job, it's the government, because they have been very slow in following through on the punishments that those companies are, were supposed to pay. And with good reason, because basically, had, they, had, it been, had they been harder, had there been harder punishments and had there been Harder enforcement, I mean, like the issue was you could possibly have c collapsed this African construction industry. And that was part of the reasoning that, w that went on. But just to end there is that I really don't think that our view should be that there should be less scrutiny of government corruption. 
Um, there should be a heck of a lot more because if you saw the stuff that comes through our inboxes every day, the phone calls we get, it's the tip of the iceberg. Mm. This country is really, really, really rotten, the public sector in this country. And like, we could delude you with like stuff that would make you slit your wrists until we have, we have no wrists left. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, we can't do that. People don't want to... We can't do that to our, to our readers. I mean, like, we have to mix things. But it's actually worse than anything that you mm -hmm. ever thought. And, like, the fixing is going to take ages. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I do think that, and I'm, I'm going to sound a bit syrupy and say that, like, I think we are at a point now. I mean, like, and we've had the negative news, and the negative news will continue. But I think there's, a, there's an opportunity in South Africa over the next five years or so. Lovely. To, to do things very differently Thank and to dream bigger. Thanks, Marley. Last comment from you, Clem, if you have one. No, it's, it's that, uh, as, as I think uh, we've all agreed, things are looking better. Uh, if we'd had this conversation two years ago, we would have probably been a lot more pessimistic, but I do think the change of leadership is a highly significant mm. and, and, and green flag, and so far, so good. So, you know, I'm, I'm certainly in a much more positive mindset than I was um, before S Cyril uh, took over the leadership. And so far, I, I think that, that using his particular way of doing things has, has actually worked. And, and so I, I do feel that people should be more optimistic about the future um, now uh, than they, they have been. Because the one other thing is, you know, Mandela was fantastic, but he was just five years. Um, I think that Cyril is trying to put into practice a lot of the attributes that Mandela had. And so, yes, we went through that fairly rocky period in between, but um, I'm, I'm now quite hopeful that we will stay in the Premier League. Um, or be at a level where we are once again recognized more as a winning than a losing nation. Yeah. Lovely. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. So what a wide-ranging discussion. Please join me in thanking Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.